Hello everybody and welcome to the April Charleston, South Carolina Power BI user group meeting. So thanks for attending. I am so excited. We got two awesome people here to talk to us today. And we do a couple of these remote on a regular basis every year anyhow. So this is not too far out of the norm for us. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. If you're not a member of the Charleston Power BI chapter, I strongly encourage you. And actually, if you're not a member of the user group at all, you should join. So you could go to pbiusergroup.com. It's free to join. There are meetings everywhere, and quite a few of them are having virtual meetings. And as I mentioned, you should join our chapter because we have virtual meetings anywhere from uh, three to eight times a year on a regular basis. And then we try to do our meeting quarterly in person um, where everyone comes in. We're a small but mighty chapter. So uh, in the Power BI user group, there are also some other events that you could attend. There is one coming up called the Power BI virtual group, uh, or sorry, the Power BI virtual event. And I just turned my slide, so let's see. Okay, I don't have the date on that, but there, there are a couple, oh, it's on the next slide. There are a couple of these. These are two days of virtual training. There are five coming up, as you can see, um, the different dates. May 20th is for GP and reporting. May 27th is for Power BI Ecosystem. May, uh, June 17th is realizing the potential of the Power Platform for D60, uh, D365 finance and operations. And uh, the 23rd is the potential of power platform tools for Dynamics 365 CE and CRM administrators. And then finally on June 24th is modernizing Dynamics 365 BC and NAV uh, for financial reporting and analytics and the power platform. And I'm actually speaking at that one. We're going to uh, stray a little bit. We're going to be not talking about so much uh, analytics, me and my co-presenter, Kim Kongel. We're going to um, be talking about distribution. So that should be a lot of fun. I also want to point out there is Power Platform World Tours. I've been to quite a few of them and they are great fun. They're two days long. The next one is going to be virtual. It was supposed to be in New York City, but we have decided not to go uh, for obvious reasons. So it's going to be virtual May 13th and 14th. So if you would like to attend without uh, having to get a plane ticket, then you're perfectly welcome to do so. There is a charge for these, but they're two day long and they're pretty powerful. Right now, the Chicago event is still scheduled, but we'll see what happens with that. Right now, it's scheduled for June 16th and 17th. Now, I also want to point out the community summit that happens every fall. It is scheduled to be in Nashville in October. There is also one in Europe scheduled in Barcelona at the end of June. I'm not sure if that's going to make it or not. We'll see. Um, Australia is also sometime in 2020. Well, so check those out as well, depending on where you are. And then I want to talk about upcoming meetings for our chapter. On May 18th is our next meeting. It is remote. It'll be 3 p.m. Eastern time. And my friend Devin Knight is going to be presenting on data storytelling with Power BI. I've seen him do this presentation and it's really very, very good. I walked away thinking about a lot of things. And then in June, I'm still confirming the date and the topic, but um, Chuck, you might have to help make sure I get his name right. Aviv Ezrachi. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Thank you. Uh, it, from the Microsoft office in Israel is going to be uh, presenting. And apparently, according to Chuck, I got a really big uh, to do getting him in. Our, so he said we are in for something really cool. So I'm working with him on what topic it is we want to see. I'm guessing it's going to be ALM and Power BI, things that he ha can't talk about. So I've broken into jail a little bit, but he's working on some super cool features. Oh, yay. Awesome. So I'm super excited about that. If you'd like to hear a particular topic, then feel free to get this, uh, click on this uh, URL or QR code or get the URL, the bit.ly forward slash PBIUG, all capital letters. And you can tell us what it is you're interested in hearing because that's what we want to hear. So now we're going to start with our presentations. We have two amazing presenters. 
uh, Chuck is going to give us a, a little tiny mini taste of what's new in one of the Power Platform products. So um, you can't see my slide, Chuck, but what everybody is looking at, it says Charles Sterling, Microsoft, that has your Twitter, and then it says Community Ruler of All Things Power Platform. Can't so, argue with that. Yeah, that's the title I gave you because I think that's pretty powerful. So I am going to, uh, if you go ahead and connect to the screen, or share your screen and let me pull up there we go all right now we see covid patients and i'm going to mute myself I, but before i do i want to remind everybody that um oh we've already got someone who said they're so excited um, oh yep and uh, one wahoo and one from my one of my co uh, chapter leaders, Rhett Cipher. So yay, Rhett, we got Chuck. All right, so Charles Sterling, seriously, the rule, community ruler of all things power platform. So Chuck, I'm gonna mute, take it away. Okay, I told Ike I have five minutes. Let's see what I can do. We're at six after Ike, you can, get, you can keep me honest. So what we're looking at here right now, guys, is a Power BI report. Uh, I had one of the local hospitals ask me and say, hey, we've got some data reporting challenges. We need to be a much more agile, much more lightweight. And I actually want to be able to answer the questions and add data. So I'm actually going to sneak away a little bit and show you one of the topics I'm actually promising Belinda that I'll cover is the ability to go out and add data directly from my Power BI report. So I can actually go ahead and add new customers in here. Since I only have five minutes, I'm not going to do that. What I am going to do is let's go back into the first page and actually maybe show you a little bit about maybe doing things like adding a chat bot directly inside of my Power BI report. So we're going to wait for it to load. Here we go. And I think this one actually hasn't been trained all that well. I haven't actually given it a lot of topics. But um, yeah, so it actually looks like uh, I was helping on this work on uh, SharePoint Europe. Um, they were actually doing some RANA work as well. But this is actually one of the places we could do it. In addition to it, I've actually been also working on um, making training available. And in addition to actually having apps that show you what training is there, of course, answering questions. So here is a Canvas-based app, and I could go ahead and go out and say things like, I don't know, list training. And what we should go out and go and say, yes, oh, that wasn't very good. It should have actually just known that I meant list training. And then it says what products, but it actually went out and answered some questions and say, maybe I'm looking for Power Apps because that's the team that I'm, um, I think I organization report into. What topics do you want? And I can go out and answer a video. Okay. So this is actually Power Virtual Agents. It's the newest member of the Power Platform. And what I wanted to actually share with you, and maybe Belinda will get me back and we'll do a, a deep dive, but for you guys to go out and create it, and you can see it's still working away, what it's doing is actually working against a database, and it actually pulled all of this directly against the database. So as I add new entries for uh, my Power Virtual Agents, or actually Power Apps videos, you'll actually get more of them. How do I get started? So what you do is you go to aka.ms forward slash try PVA. And I'm going to get blended actually put that in there if I can type it. Again, that's try PVA, aka.ms forward slash try PVA. And you should actually see the screen that I'm looking at right now. And if you click this big black button that says start free, the next screen that you're going to say is it's going to say uh, create a new bot. Now, we decided that one of the coolest dogs in the world are chimeras. Right, Blenda? Yep. That's right. That's what kind of dog she has. And if you're not familiar, a chimera is actually uh, Jack Russell and a um, and a, 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 a little dog. Wow. Well, it's so, a mix um, of two breeds or like okay. two different species. So, yep. Oh, uh, okay. So that's what the term chimera comes from. Okay. So I've actually went ahead and created the chimera one, but it, this chimera doesn't actually know anything about dogs yet. So what I wanted to do is in my three minutes left, two minutes left, um, I'm going to go ahead and show you how you would actually create a brand new Chimera topic. So if I want to go out and say, uh, what is a Chimera? And that's just the name of the topic. Um, and I would go out and say, Chimera is my topic. And what else you might have? In Australia, you use the word bitsa. I like that term. Uh, mutt, I think, is actually what we use here. Uh, mixed breed, etc. Okay. So I didn't know that. I thought Chimera was actually specific to that one. Now, if I go out and have any of these, um, and let's say that this is actually going to go out and tell you how much you should, I don't know, exercise them or actually, no, I'll tell you about the breeds themselves. Um, you go out and say, sure. 
I can help you with that. And you might want to ask a question of, um, uh, what do you want to learn? And I would go out and say, food or, and actually, I don't know if you noticed this, as I typed in food, it actually gave me an option. Let's do another one, exercise. Um, we decided that our doggies probably need some more exercise, um, much like us. Exercise. Okay, well, you get the idea. Clearly, I've misspelled it. And actually, it tried to help me misspell it correctly. But at this point, um, and I can go out and just show the message. Of course, this would be uh, probably more in depth. Uh, you can feed them anything and link. And of course, this is uh, show a message. They don't like that <laughs> at all. Okay, I'm done. I'm going to hit save. Now, in this case, I would probably go ahead and publish this so I can make it available. But actually, let's go ahead and I think I got one minute left. And in my one minute, I'm going to go to channels and I'm going to show you in a custom website. Uh, what this looks like. So let's go ahead and grab this page. Uh, actually, better yet, save me some time. I'll just go to the demo website. This is actually already done. So copy, new tab, boom. And here is the website, um, just like that I put it in Power Virtual Agent or uh, Power Apps or Power BI. And I could go out and say, uh, what did I say? Bitsa is actually, mm -hmm. is actually what Australia mm -hmm. called it. And they should go out and use that trigger, use this to this spot to publish in Power Virtual. Hmm. Well, like it was smart publish. enough to tell you that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, um, yeah it's it's going out and saying you haven't. Yeah, okay. So what's happened is is it hasn't been published. Um, so what we could do is let's go ahead and actually just um, do it right here. So this is actually what you would have seen. And if I go out and type in Bitsa. While it's publishing, it's probably in process of publishing because I literally just created it a second ago. Sure, I could help you with that. Remember, this is the dialogue that me and you just did. What do you want to learn? Do you want to learn about food or exercise? And if I go out and click on food, it actually walks me through this link. I could have called um, a Power Virtual, uh, sorry, a Power Automate Flow, et cetera. But this is a five minute introduction, now like eight minute, because I still have two minutes from Ike on how to get started with Power Virtual Agents. And I'm gonna hopefully come back with Belinda and show how I can wire this up into lots of different places and do some advanced topics. So Belinda, yes. back to you. That is a deal. You don't know what you did when you said that because- um, Oh, uh, we can't hear her. You're muted. Oh, am I muted? Oh, hang on. Sorry, I thought I muted myself, unmuted myself, and I guess I muted myself instead. But yeah, that's a dangerous thing to say something like that to Belinda saying, oh, yeah, I want to come back. But, you know, I saw Daniel Christian at um, the Atlanta World Tour for the Power Platform. He used, he did a demo of the Power Virtual Agent, and he did it against the schedule for the event. So what a cool way to just make it something, you know, useful for yourself as well. Yep. Anyhow, thank you, Chuck. Yep, we're going to schedule that for sure. We'll probably do it in between sessions, so we might as well be learning while we're sitting at home, right? <laughs> um, next, um, I'm going to go ahead and dive right into... Uh, Ike's presentation. So let me introduce Ike Ellis. He's a Microsoft MVP. And on the screen, you could see uh, he has a webpage, ikeellis.com. I love it. Nice and simple. And uh, you could also from there connect to his YouTube channel. And his Twitter handle, it, you could see it on the screen at Ike underscore Ellis. So I'm going to go ahead and maybe Stop the slide. Now we see you guys. So Ike, you could go ahead and share your screen and take over. Great, thank you, Belinda. And thanks, Chuck, that was awesome. It's great to uh, have such a great lead in. So, um, so I wanna tell you about something a little bit off topic, if that's okay. Um, just real quick, I run a couple of different user groups. I run the San Diego Power Apps and Power BI user group. 
Um, and we are going to start hosting virtual meetings. So um, you can look us up on meetup.com if you're interested in that. But um, this is called the San Diego Tech Immersion Group. And our, we're going to meet tonight. We are a technical book club. And so we just, at book, book is not real. But um, what we do is we take a topic and we dive into that topic for four or five or six months, and then we switch topics. And um, this topic that we're starting tonight is Python for data science. And what Ooh. we're doing is we're taking the learning camp career track, which is actually 22 courses. Um, we are only gonna be covering about eight or nine of those courses. So what I would do, if you're interested in learning Python, and you're a data analyst or a data scientist, um, I would register for data camp. And then tonight, we will be covering intro to Python, intermediate Python, and um, doing a project. And then every month, we're going to be diving deeper into data science with Python. So if you do all 22 courses, um, you can also use our meetup messaging to ask questions, or because we are going to do all 22. We're just only going to video a conversation about these 8 to 12 or so. Um, and then once we're done with this, we're going to put it all on YouTube. So if you miss a meeting, that's OK. Just check out our channel and go to YouTube and join us. So anyway, this is all free. I just thought maybe you, there would be some overlap and maybe you guys would be interested. I have to say I am super stoked about that. So I might have to change my evening plans. I was just, I was going to travel to my patio and have dinner, but I might do that yeah. instead. <laughs> and yeah, also, we, I, let, yeah. me, let me tell you too, Ike, that Mariana Gomez just chatted that he was glad to see you and uh, Chuck I'm presenting. Glad to see him. And so, uh, that's yeah. That's great. So, yeah, I love Mariana. He's great. Haven't seen him in a few months, and hopefully it won't be too much longer before we get to hang out again. So, mm -hmm. um, so do, how many people are online, Belinda, if you don't mind me asking? Um, you know what? I don't know, because I don't have, I think, 13. 13, okay. Yep. So this is small enough. So I'm going to talk about data modeling, um, and not just for Power Query and Power BI, but I'm going to talk about data modeling in analytics in general, and then specifically in Power BI at the end, and Power Query. Um, this presentation might be a little bit provocative because I'm going to say some things that I think are a little bit extreme, and that's okay. They're intended to provoke. So if I say something that is provoking you, let me know that. We're a small enough group that you can talk to us and we'll talk to you. Um, what we've found is that I want you to be thinking about some of the principles that I'm about to outline. And provoking you is probably the easiest way to get you to think about it and then c combat me. And that's fine. You know, I welcome the discussion. Um, I don't feel like I have all the answers. And so you might have a good point if you disagree with something that I'm saying. Um, if you don't or you agree, let me know that too. Like, oh, I found that to be true. You know, we, we've learned to do that that way. Um, so with that said, um, this is all stuff that I did when I was at Pass Summit. This is me, by the way. Belinda showed you all this information already. Um, uh, the agenda that we're going to discuss, we're going to talk about where we are today and how we got there. We're going to talk about where we're headed. And then we're going to talk about some challenges to data modeling that are coming from the business, challenges to data modeling that are coming from the cloud. And then we're going to talk positioning where we're headed with the business. Does that sound like a good agenda? Very cool. I'm excited okay. that you're going to okay. talk a little bit about Internet of Things. Okay, good. All right, great. So we have a lot of reasons why we build oh, I, analytical. Yes. I hate to um, I hate to interrupt you right from the get go, but okay. um, can um, you tell us uh, how we can find that data camp leak? Someone's asking about that. If you just um, go to datacamp.com, they have these things called career tracks, and the, it's called the, I think, Data Science with Python or Python for Data Science, one of the two. Or if you go to sdtig.com and click the link in our description, it'll take you right there. SDTIG for San Diego Tech Immersion Group. GIT.com. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. So we have several reasons why we build analytical systems. 
Uh, we built them maybe to alert us when fraud is happening. We built them because we're building reports for Wall Street or for um, some external auditor. We built them because upper management wants to make better decisions. They want to decide like, we're a retail organization. Where should we open our next location? Or do we have any locations we need to close? Or we are a hospital. Which patients should we treat first versus other patients? Um, we might use them for tactical reporting to management, meaning if I am a leader uh, with like 10 direct reports, when should I hire my 11th one, right? Um, we might do it for data uh, advanced analysis like machine learning and deep learning or building a neural network or something like that. Um, we might need it for data lineage, like if data lineage means where did this data come from? How did I get this piece of data? And, and does the data source affect what I do with it? If the data source tells me that it's no good and I need to delete that piece of data, how do I know where that data went so that I can delete it later on down the line? Data governance, meaning what do I do with data? Am I managing it correctly? Are the correct people seeing it? Am I archiving it correctly? Am I backing it up correctly? Data brokerage uh, between transactional applications, meaning if I have a big organization and one app does inventory management and another app does HR, um, but sometimes the inventory management app needs a list of all new warehouse employees, um, they, where do they go to get that data? And sometimes what they do is they go into a, our, our analytical system and pull that data out and put it into their warehousing app, right? Um, and then historical data, archiving data, like what did my business look like 10 years ago, right? So we do all these things in an analytical system. And typically for like the last 20 years or so, we built analytical systems like this. We pulled data from a source, we've moved it down the pipe, and uh, we call that movement ETL or extract, transform, and load, where we move it to a staging database, we move it to the ODS, we move it to a data warehouse, we move it potentially to a cube or to a Power BI shared uh, data set, and then we build reporting off of it. That's typically what we've done. And staging is just there so that when we pull data off the source and we make a mistake, we don't have to go back to the source and load the source over and over every time we have to redo something or, or rebuild something. Um, ODS is translated to operational data store. That is a normalized data repository where we'll do things like data brokering and some reporting and data exploration out of there, uh, maybe some light cleaning. But if we go back to this diagram, if we have four different data sources, like a data source for HR and a data source for warehousing data and a, da a data source for Twitter feeds or whatever it is, right? When we move that to the staging, staging is big, but not quite as big because typically staging only has about 90 days of data or something like that in it. But ODS gets to be pretty big because ODS doesn't typically delete very often. So if these source tables have maybe 100 tables each in these sources, you're going to see 400 tables in the ODS. Like we typically don't do a lot of data normalization or denormalization. We just kind of keep it the way it is in the source. And that's good if we're trying to figure out what the source gave us. But sometimes it creates these ODSs that are gigantic, and they have all these tables, and it's hard to explore and hard to figure out, right? And so what we typically do is we go and build a data warehouse out of that. Data warehouses tend to be smaller than the ODS. If the, data, if the ODS had 300 tables, the data warehouse or data mart has like 12 tables or 20 tables or 30 tables. It's not going to have 300 is my point. And if the ODS is like 100 gigs of data, the data mart might be one or two or three gigs of data. It's, it's going to be a small distilled subset of that. And our typical way of building those data marts is by using the Kimball method, which we've been doing for like 30 years, where we gather requirements, we do physical design and dimension modeling and ETL development, and then we deploy. And Ralph Kimball writes books on this. I'm not going to cover what Ralph has already said, but uh, it's worth reading. Um, typically, what we do in the Ralph Kimball method is we create an enterprise bus matrix where we, we pay attention to what decision makers say about how they do their job. Um, for instance, they say things like, I want to look at sales by date, or I want to look at shipping freight amount by product, or I want to look at uh, manufacturing delayed arrivals by warehouse, right? And when a decision maker starts saying those things, Pay attention to the by word, 
because when they say I want to look at sales by employee, the sales is typically the fact that they want to look into. And the by employee, the employee is typically the dimension that they're going to look at. And, and so when they want to look at sales, they'll say, I want to look at sales by employee, sales by product, sales by region, sales by um, uh, customer type, right? So the sales is one single fact, and the, they might be looking, slicing and dicing it by several different dimensions. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm sure those people that have been on this call have, they've done this before. They've seen data warehouses, so they've seen star schemas, right? That's what I'm describing to you as a star schema. The reason why I'm telling you this is because there are a lot of cloud vendors out there and a lot of data vendors and a lot of product vendors out there. And they are saying that they, you don't need a star schema anymore because their technology is so fast that there's no reason to build a star schema. And, and the cloud vendors are saying that too. If you listen to AWS or Azure or GCP, they'll say, well, you don't need to build a data mart or a data warehouse anymore because we our, our technology is so fast that you don't need to go through the effort to transform down the pipeline and, and build a cube or build a good Power BI data set, right? And in a way, they are right about that. And in a way, they are very, very wrong about that. So while it is true that we have some amazing technology that's been released with columnar indexing and caching and putting the reads off the transaction systems and all this amazing stuff, the reason why we build star schemas is maybe perhaps not strictly for performance, although I would argue that if we build a proper star schema, we'll get better compression and therefore better performance. Um, the reason why we build star schemas is because it distills the complicated 400 tables that we find in these transaction databases over here down to about five or six or 12 tables. So it distills 400 tables here down to 12 tables over here. And that distilling promotes accurate data, consistent data across all our reports and a simple teachable view of our organization that ideally anybody should be able to dive into and learn how our organization um, is doing business. So while it might be true that we don't strictly need star schemas for performance, we do need them to distill complicated business ideas in a way that analysts and decision makers can understand. And the more distilled those star schemas are, the easier it will be for people to learn it, use it, and be self-reliant when they're using it. So, so yeah, I have a ahead. question for you on that. So yeah. what would you say if you were doing a project for someone and their data vendor saying, oh, you don't have to do this because we're fast enough. What would you use as your reasoning for saying, hey, I, wanna, I want you to use a star schema anyhow? Um, well, the, what I would use is self-service BI becomes less likely the more tables you add to the data model. So if you're telling me that I don't need to distill my data into a consumable format, then you're telling me that nobody will be uh, self-realizing when it comes to data and the reporting, that they won't be independent. They'll need me to digest it all the time. That's one thing I would say. Mm -hmm. um, Another thing I would say is for Power BI, we want data locality. So I'm going to have to move the data anyway. If I want to use the Power BI service or Power BI premium and I need to get the data in there, I don't want to be ideally using direct query um, because I'll lose data locality. You know, not to call it any vendors, but Snowflake is famous for this, right? Snowflake says, just leave all your data in Snowflake. You'll never need to get it out of there. But then the minute you use any analytical tool, you're immediately moving it, right? That makes me question why the data is even in there in the first place sometimes. But anyway, um, okay. So I don't want to be a star schema data modeling class here. You guys should probably know this already. And there are plenty of other avenues where you can learn more about it if you need it. Um, I'm just here to kind of over, over, to over, give an overview of the fundamentals of it and to remind you these things are still important. We still need this. 
Um, and this is an idea of a star schema. There's orders in the center. There's dimensions that are on the side. Five or six tables are ideal. Maybe you want your star schemas to be 12. As soon as star schemas get up to 20, I start getting a little suspicious that they're overly complicated. When they're way over 20, I'm like, no one's using this. Like, this is way too complicated. We need to drop these, this table count down so that it's more usable, more friendly, more teachable. Okay. Um, and so there's some considerations in building dimension tables. Dimension tables are usually wide. They have lots of columns. They have keys that join to the um, fact table. Fact tables are typically numeric. Um, if you have a lot of text in the fact table, that might be an, exam an example where you might want to take some of that text and build a different dimension. Not all the time, but sometimes. Um, and, and anyway, you can read the slide yourself. You don't need me to cover it. Now, again, I'm going to repeat myself. Why do we make star schemas? Because they're easy to use and understand. It's one version of the truth. It's easy to create aggregations by single passing over the data, much smaller table count, faster queries. We can use it to feed cubes or Power BI shared data sets if we want, certified data sets if we want. And it's supported by a lot of different BI tools like Excel pivot tables, Power BI, Tableau, a bunch of other things too. Here's what I always say in doing data modeling for analytics. I say you can either start out by making a star schema or you can one day wish you did. Those are the only two choices. And there's Snowflake. I don't really like Snowflake, but I figured I'd cover it because every once in a while, maybe 1% to 5% of the time, there's a valid reason to do a Snowflake schema. But typically, I avoid them because people find them confusing. Let's go back to this, though. Am I alone in this? Have you guys all built systems like this where you pulled data from a source and you pulled it down a pipeline to eventually it got to a Power BI data set? Um, yes. And I also want to point out Mariano has a comment. Um, I, I believe the truth lies somewhere in between. What I understand is you don't necessarily have to too many stages and ETL operations between your OLTP system and your data warehouse. I am getting to that. Yep, I'm getting to that. Yep. We'll but have a the punchline answer, here, Marianne. The answer to your question is yes, I've built something similar to that, and I'm sure everyone else has as well. Okay, great. All right, great. So we're all talking the same language. That's great. Now, there are some weaknesses to that system, though, that we need to be cautious of. Um, for instance, if I were dragging data from a source system and I was trying to get into a Power BI report, I'm moving that data over and over and over and over again, ETL, 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 right? And then if I need to add a single column to my report that I don't have in the data warehouse or in the ODS, let's say that the warehousing system added a new feature. And in that feature, they, they said, there's a bunch of new columns, and we want one of those columns for reporting. I am now adding it in this very simple architecture nine times before it finally gets to my report. And so something simple like adding a column becomes something I, I'm not excited about doing. And here's the problem with that. Your businesses are changing. I used to give this lecture before COVID. Now, after COVID, everybody's changing, pivoting, scrambling to stay in business and to beat their competition and to stay relevant, right? And so as the businesses change, we want to be in a position where we embrace that change, where when they want to add columns and modify reports, we're excited to modify those reports. That's what we want, is a place where change is exciting because the more excited we are to change, the more the business will think that we're a partner as they want to change instead of resistant to their change, right? Change is a central part of our job and we should look for ways to make change enjoyable for us because if we don't, we're gonna hate our job. We will, that will happen, okay? All right, so, so many of you, because of this problem where you change nine times, have decided to go directly to the source. Like, I'm going to get rid of the data warehouse. I'm going to get rid of staging and ODS and all those things. And that I'm not saying that was a bad decision. I'm just saying that that also comes with the drawback. Because if we go directly to the source for all of the things that we need for our data models, and then the source changes, we're going to be constantly changing our, our reports. So if, if we have one source hitting five or six or seven different data sets, and the source changes, we are still changing nine different things. So we're still in the same position. We have just moved the problem a little bit. 
And that's not an exciting place to be. And then the more we go directly to the data source to build Power BI and Power Query data models, the messier I have noticed your data models are. And I have seen this data model in real life and I did not enjoy it and I know you don't enjoy it. So the danger of ignoring building a star schema that is centralized and shared is severe. There's a big danger there. Where do you get a printer that prints that wide? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, and I should also see, point out, Mariano said, ah, oh, I see where you're going with this. Okay, yeah. great. But yeah, that's that's crazy seeing um, that kind of, oh, I, I would, that's a job I wouldn't take. Right, right. Then there's another problem with SQL Server, specifically with staging and ODS, but I know a lot of us in the Power BI world like to use SQL Server for building data marts and and the problem with SQL Server is SQL was actually designed for transactional systems. Now, they have modified SQL to do analytical systems. That's true. They have done that. And it does it very well. But there's just a couple of problems with it, by the way. If we use SQL Server for staging at ODS, we're actually writing data multiple times on a single insert. So when we data comes into SQL, we have to write it in memory. We have to write it on the log. The log has a data structure that's different than the disk's data structure underneath it. So when we write it to the log data structure, we then have to write something to the disk data structure. Then we have to write to the MDF and then the disk subsystem for the MDF. And then we have to update any indexes that we have and the disk subsystem. And all of that has to happen before a single transaction is completed meaning that insert doesn't get recorded until those seven things have happened. And that can be slow. Um, and then SQL is kind of expensive because it's licensed based on the number of cores you use. So if you need a bigger SQL server, you are going to need more processors, more cores, more CPUs. And look, I've got a SQL server that one of my customers uh, manages for us where they pay about a million dollars in licensing for that server. Um, so it can get expensive the larger your data grows. And what that does is if a decision maker says, hey, I want to grab all this data, I want to grab Twitter sentiment analysis, and you've got this pipeline here, you're going to be resistant to adding new data sources because you're going to know if my SQL-based ODS blows up on me, I'm not going to want to pay for that. It, it's going to be too expensive for me, right? So the, again, you're resistant to change because you're using SQL for staging an ODS, right? Um, weakness number three, great big data warehouses are sometimes difficult to change and maintain. Um, I teach a cloud uh, architecture, a cloud data architecture course, where I teach people how to move data to the cloud, and I teach them how to make high-performing transactional database systems. And I write something on the top of that whiteboard on day one, I write, small things are changeable and scalable. And I leave it up there for the rest of the class so they see it every day they come into class. Um, and I really believe that. I think it's one of the most important things that data professionals can remember about the cloud. Small things are changeable and scalable, and large things are neither. So the reason why I remind you that is we would much rather have a much a lot of small things than one big giant thing. So if we go back to this architecture where we're used to building these big data warehouses, that thing's not built for the cloud. It's too big. It's too expensive. It's too hard to change, and it doesn't scale, right? We would rather have a whole bunch of little small things in the cloud. Much rather have that. I have two comments for you. One, you told me about your um, big chalkboard at your door. You should put that statement in your house as well. Because it's true yeah. in life, right? Yeah, it is true. Yeah. yeah, if we're minimalist and we avoid big, giant things, yeah, we're more flexible and agile, right? Yeah, for sure. And the other thing is uh, my co-leader, Rhett, uh, added a comment. The new data analysis feature released in preview earlier this week um, should help identify any impact of changes to your data model or any asset in the service dependent on the resource to be updated. Um, should say impact analysis. Oh, the impact analysis, sorry. Yep. Yeah, that's interesting. I might show some features in just a little bit. Yep. Okay. 
So number four, it's very difficult to move great big things to the cloud. Remember how we said that SQL Server's licensing was based on CPU? So if you have a great big data warehouse and your boss says, hey, move that to Azure, you're going to look at, you know, six to seven figures a year to move a great big thing. But if you said, okay, just take this subset, a couple of gigs and move that to Azure, no problem. I'll, I can do that, right? But these great big things have a very difficult time moving to the cloud when they're SQL based. Um, the way I liken it is like, if you were on a freeway and let's say you're driving your Toyota Corolla, or I don't know what Toyota has right now, but anyway, you're driving some sedan. I drive a Prius. Prius, there we go. You're driving your Prius. And um, would you rather have every other car on the road be a semi truck or other Priuses? Other Priuses, no doubt. Yes. And the reason why is because when you have a bunch of small things, they get to shuffle and move much faster. Where if you have big giant semi trucks, it makes the Prius slow because the Prius has lost the flexibility as it navigates through these big, big things. So when we have a bunch of small things, we have knobs to turn and we can make th some things fast and some things slow and move them around and reshuffle them much easier. And the cloud will reward us for that. And if we're inflexible and fragile, the cloud will punish us for that because we'll always be down and we will always have huge, huge bills we're paying. So, is this resonating with anybody? Am, am I clearly outlining some of the problems we've had with data modeling up to this point? Um, you have with me, but everyone else, just a reminder, use the chat to chat. Okay, cool, thanks. So when I interview businesses about their analytic teams, I hear a bunch of complaints and they're very common. I, I, now I just kind of write them down in my audit before I even interview anybody. They say things like, the analytic team doesn't change as quickly as we'd like. Or they said they'd work for all departments, but they only seem to work for finance and sales. Or this data is unreliable because this report is far different than this other report. Or every time I ask for something new, it takes six weeks and by then the opportunity has passed. Or these cubes have outdated references to business concepts that are using terms of vocabulary that are outdated. And I hear this all the time when I go help teams become more in sync with their businesses. But what the business doesn't understand is that these problems are actually caused by the business. They blame technology and they blame the analysts for these problems, but they don't understand that they are the cause of these problems. And the reason why they're the cause of it is because the business worships at the altar of consistency. And a lot of that, now what do I mean by that? When there is some data that's not aligned with other data, the business flips out and they want to throw it all away. And the reason why they do that is because if I'm the CEO of a company and Belinda is my chief marketing officer and I say, Belinda, conversions are down. Why is that? The easiest way for Belinda to end the conversation is your numbers are different than my numbers, right? Now she has effectively deferred the, content, the tension in the room to the analytic team because they worship at the altar of consistency. And it's easy to say when the numbers are wrong, who knows what to believe? I think we're doing fine. You think we're bad, right? Now the meeting devolves into a 20 minute conversation about the reliability of the numbers and who's right. By then the time has passed, Belinda's off the hot seat, she can go off get the conversion numbers back up. By the time she has that meeting again, she can say, look, even your wrong numbers are up, right? So we're doing fine, right? So this is one, one of the many examples I have of where the business puts pressure on analytic teams because this worship of consistency is severe. And we, then- You need to give this presentation to um, all of Washington, D.C. <laughs> Thank you. So the other thing that the business does is they tend to say, I want that data fast, meaning I want that data in real time. So we call that a low data latency environment. And the other thing they want is they want you to deliver a report quickly. 
they want you to, when they tell you a problem, they want that report in their hand that day. And what I tell the business is, you don't get those three things. That does not happen. So you either can have highly consistent reporting, but that'll take time to deliver the data and time to um, build, or you can loosen up on the consistency, but I will deliver faster for you and I'll deliver closer to real time. That's the, those are the scales. And I don't care who's selling you a solution. I don't care if it's Snowflake or Tableau or Salesforce or Google. If they tell you we have real-time data that's 100% clean, they are selling you something that does not exist. This is always, always a choice. And the business doesn't understand that they're making that choice. And they need clear guardrails to help them make better decisions. So there are three types of consistency that cause overhead. There's internal consistency. Does this report match what the report is saying? Meaning, if I have a report of detail rows, do the totals add up, right? There's external consistency. Does this report match every other report that I have? And then there's historical consistency. Does, it, does this report match itself from years past, right? Now, I would argue that the first one's mandatory. Um, your detail row should always match the totals, right? If it doesn't, you have not finished that report, right? So you have to do that. One. Um, but the remaining two cause a lot of problems and headaches when we worship those two. So let me tell you a story. So I went to a very popular and powerful company. You have used their products, 100% you've used their products. And I won't tell you what they do because I shouldn't. I don't like to divulge company names, but I will say that you um, you use they're a fruit company. How about that? So they they grow, purchase, and distribute fruit. Okay. And they the CEO of that company was very angry because he went and took a bunch of reports to his board of directors, and the board said, "This does not match the reports you gave us the last time we met." Effectively, they were calling the CEO untrustworthy. The CEO left that board meeting. He came back and he said. He was humiliated and furious. And when he said, why do these, why are these reports different than these other reports? His leaders said, we have 700 reports and it's too hard to make them all consistent with one another. And he, he said, show me those reports. So he went by, down and he looked, he did a spot check of these reports and he said, these reports are useless. He's like, delete all of them. He's like, I could run this entire company on 15 reports. That's one, five, 15 reports. And he wanted us to delete the other 685 reports, right? So we now he hired us as consultants to do this, right? And when he told us what he wanted, we're like, you're crazy. Like, there's no way. But he's like, nope, delete them all. And you know what? We dove into those reports and we found a lot of overlap. We found out that these five reports were pretty much the same, but maybe different sort order or one more column or different coloring or something. We found that the, some reports were totally retired. Nobody was ever using them. We found some reports were pulling data from systems nobody was using, right? And when we did the analysis, we found that the CEO was wrong. He could not run the entire company. With all his divisions and all his employees, he could not run all of them on 15 reports but we were able to bring him down to about 50, about actually 65. Wow, that's a big difference. It's a big difference. It's a big difference. And when we got him down to 65 reports, guess what happened? Those reports were consistent with one another. It was easier for us to create a new report, but we didn't want to just go back to the 700 hell we were before. And we found that there were some reports that didn't have to be consistent. They didn't. So we created a consistent reporting culture that was unique and very successful. And I'm going to share that culture with you right now. You know, so, I have, I have a similar story because I am wondering, um, and, um, I'll ask the question first and then I'll tell you why the story of why I'm asking it. Um, so how frequently should you check your reports? Um, and I ask this because I, I 
this was many, many moons ago, I was implementing one of the Dynamics accounting products at a business. And they said, as soon as this business goes live, or we'll go live as soon as you have this report matching our old report. It was AS400, that's how long ago it was. And three months later, I finally, I could not get it right. It was like just weirdness, I couldn't figure it out. I finally sat down, I'm embarrassed to say, with a calculator in their old report and found that their old report had errors in it and mine had been right all along. And so, I mean, they were so embarrassed, they're like, oh, we're not gonna co-op, co you know, we're not gonna argue over the pay um, for your time. <laughs> but, uh, but at the same time, I felt bad that I didn't sit down with a calculator to begin with. Once I first realized we were, we had some out of balance. So how frequently should you check your own reports for consistency? That's a good question. I would check them against Excel because the leaders are gonna do that. They're, I see them do it all the time. They grab the report, they grab the data, they throw it in Excel and they use Excel because they, they trust Excel. So they add the data up, they see the total, they're like, that's the total, and they go on, right? Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about that. Uh, I'll, well, I'll bring that up, Belinda, I don't mean to delay you, but give me a couple slides and we'll talk about it. Okay. So the third type of consistency is, does this report batch itself from years past? You know, how many times a company changes their um, commission structure for their salespeople? And then they say, when we build that, re when we run that report from 2012, we want to know what it looked like in 2012. And then when I go into the reports, I see terrible logic. Like if the sale date's greater than 2012, do this. If it's greater than 2016, do this. If it's older than 2012, do this. Because they need this massive calculation to exist because the report has been changing over time. And here's what I say to that. I say, if you need those reports to be the same in 2012, you better save them. You better PDF it off someplace or Excel it off someplace and put a snapshot because we are not going to maintain 20 years of calculation changes in a report and expect it to be fast and timely and accurate. We're just not going to do that. So snapshot them off and then change the calculation. Do not be beholden to historical consistency. You will kill yourself doing that. All right. Um, I call this the boat ownership of analytics. Um, I've owned three boats because I'm a slow learner. Um, the you know happiest day of boat owner's life is uh, when they buy the boat, and the second happiest is when they sell it, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that we should delete a lot of our reports. I think that we should delete a lot of those old calculations. I think we should look at the branching logic where it says, if it's older than this, do this. And get rid of all of that. There's, maintaining that is not adding significant enough value to the business to justify it. Is there anything about the way your businesses function in 2015 that will tell your decision makers anything about what 2020 would be like? Did any of those reports predict COVID? Did any of them report a sudden shutdown of the economy? Did any of them report all their workers being remote? No. So tell them to unleash themselves from the past. There's nothing about those numbers that are going to help them make better decisions. So the only reason why we need to look at 2012 numbers is because of auditing. We can snapshot that and move it on. Get off of it, right? Okay. So the main... I have I have two questions for you. Uh, okay. One question and one comment. Was that your boat in that picture? No, no, God, no. Oh, no. I was going to say uh, I only I have, have a 15. I was going to say, I, I only know. have a 15-foot sailboat, so I'm going to go to work for your company instead of uh, <laughs> yeah. mine. <laughs> and the other one, Mariano made an excellent point, and he wrote uh, that it's also the truth that reports are one of the least documented artifacts in any business, hence redundancies and inconsistencies. Yep, I agree, Mariano. Yep, thank you for that. Appreciate that. So another thing, when another problem that we often make is we try to make the star schema do everything. So remember when I opened this up, I said, we build analytic systems for fraud detection and to report to Wall Street and to report to upper management. And then they build this one thing and they do all of it on this one thing. And then when they say, change the data warehouse, you're like, I don't want to change it because every time I change it, I break 12 things I don't fully understand. And the problem why that is so fragile is because we are overloading one system to do too many things. And it is a weakness in how we design uh, our data architecture, okay? And then the other thing they say is, I want that data in real time. Well, guess what? You don't get to move it down the pipe in real time. Like, 
that takes me 20 minutes to an hour to do that. So the closest you're ever going to get is maybe an hour or two, and that's going to be expensive. So again, they're overloading the system. They're like, you want clean data and you want it fast. You don't get that. You get dirty data fast and clean data is going to take me a bit to get to you. Okay, whatever that interval is. That's the way it's always going to be, by the way. Um, so are you guys ready for the punchline? You've sat through mm -hmm. problem after problem after problem. Here's the punchline. Are you ready? Rule number one, do not be afraid of files. Let's release our, our dependency on SQL Server. Files can be cheap. Files are fast. Files can be indexed. Files can be compressed. Specifically, the file we're looking for is Parquet files. You can build these Parquet files just as easily as you can build tables in SQL Server. What now, I know a, a lot of power. What, what is a Parquet file? A Parquet file. So when I say don't be afraid of files, what I'm saying, I'm not saying CSV or TSV or whatever. I'm saying that in Azure, with Azure Data Factory, you can build Parquet files that they have data types, they have columns, they can be indexed, they can be compressed, they are splittable, they are super fast. And what you'll find is if you take a look at your traditional enterprise data architecture and you remove staging and ODS from SQL Server and instead you replace that with a file-based system, you will now have a bunch of much smaller things that can independently be moved to the cloud and they are cheap even though they can be large, they can be very large. So we can store gigs of data very cheaply and files are easier to change than tables. So, and they're more resilient. So the reason why I'm telling you this is, um, let's think about maybe not worrying so much about SQL tables right off the bat and start thinking about, can we just throw some data into a file and then put that in the cloud? Um, you will pay pennies on the dollar for doing this without losing a lot of performance. And then what we can do with Power BI is Power BI can ingest those files just like they can ingest SQL. Power BI has a data connector called the Spark data connector. Spark might seem intimidating, but all Spark does is just build a metadata layer over files. Now you're thinking, Oh, Ike, you know, I don't, you know, I can't do this. Like if you told me to put my data into files, I wouldn't be able to pull it in and have clean data or even interact with it. Or if you told me, oh, your ODS, for instance, remember when we talked about the ODS, we said it could be 50 gigs or 500 gigs or, or five terabytes or 50 terabytes. How am I going to take files that are 50 tera and ingest that into Power BI? Oh my goodness, I couldn't do it. Well, let me show you. I'm going to um, open up Azure real quick. And you're going to think, um, oh, hang on one second. Let me. Uh... And while you're logging in, I, I, I do want to stress that what a low cost solution Azure Data Lake is. <laughs> um, I've heard a couple of people recently talking about um, what they're spending on it, and it's. Uh, um, really a, an amazing bargain. It, yes. It and is. you could, and you could, if you're using local SQL data, you could build uh, triggers or stored procedures to run on a regular basis that upload that data to Azure Data Lake for you. Could you not? Um, yeah, but I probably wouldn't. I would probably use Azure Data Factory to do that. Mm. Um, so this is Spark, and this might seem intimidating to people who have never seen it before. But um, what I want to show is just, let's do lab three. Let's see what's in here. Okay, if I scroll down, all right, do, 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 do. How about this one? What does that look like to you, that line two? <coughs> that looks like a, something from DAX or even, um, yeah, it looks like a little DAX statement. Or SQL. Right? Yeah, SQL. Both, mm -hmm. yep. both data analysts know SQL, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go down. Okay, so we've seen that, right? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, let's see if we've got anything else here that's interesting. Do, do, do. There's another SQL statement there. Yeah. Okay. Let me look again. Do, do, do. Um, when we use it, do we have to do the do, do, do? Yeah. I always do that to myself and everybody makes fun of me. Um, let's see if we've got. So everybody example. at home on the count of three. Do, do, do. <laughs> One, two, um, three. Do, do, do. I'm looking for a good example of uh, what I'm looking for. Um, let's see. You know, oh, now I, I might this. I might be intimidating this? you. Oh, there you go. Look at does that. Does this look good? Look at this. Does yep. that look like SQL? Okay. It does. Does this look like SQL? Yes. Okay. How about, look, we do from, we do where, we do group by, we do having, we do lead, like windowing functions if we want, right? Now, this SQL data is being done over files. So when I come back to my slide deck and I say, you can use Power BI and pull data from Databricks and Spark, our synonyms, uh, Databricks and Spark and that are file-based, the way you would pull the data is through a statement like this or a statement like this. Can you do that? Does that look intimidating to you? No, I could do that. You can do that, right. So, so the point is, when people talk about a data lake and they talk about Azure Data Lake Storage being a place where the data can grow cheaply, I've noticed that people are sometimes resistant to it because they're intimidated by this file-based structure. And I'm telling you, there's nothing to be intimidated about. If you're smart enough to learn DAX, you are smart enough to use this. And you can get the benefit of it, the affordability of it, the compression of it, and the speed of it, um, and the changeability of it without a, too much learning. You can do this. Okay. So um, here's another example of a modern data architecture that we've done. This is what we would call uh, the source system. We use ETL to put in Azure Blob Storage. Now it's file-based, right? We might build some ETL using Spark Logic. And then we might land that into a SQL database still. Now, a SQL database can still be part of our data architecture. Power BI is still part of our data architecture, but Power BI can either pull from SQL, but now this time it's much smaller, right? It's a targeted data mart with just a star schema, right? It can pull from Azure Analysis Services, right? It can even go back all the way and pull from Azure Blob Storage if we want. We might be building these things in Azure Data Factory rather than in Databricks if we want. We can do that too, and it's not that difficult. Okay, now let's go back to the list. Remember what we said, why do we build analytic systems? We have alerting and reporting and uh, data lineage and everything, and the problem is we overload it with one system. Well, we don't have to overload it with one system. We can, um, we can take the consistent path this is like, we take data from the source, move it file-based to Azure Blob Storage. We use Azure Data Factory and we move it right into a SQL database. And then we build our Power BI data sets there. And this is what we tell the business. We say clean, 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 clean. That's clean, consistent data. Or what we can do is we can build an alerting system. That's a, that's a separate system. We build both of them. We can say on the alerting system, we pull the source data into Azure Blob Storage, and then maybe we use stream processing to use Azure Stream Analytics, and then build it directly. We will use a Power BI dashboard that pulls it off of Stream Analytics, so we can create a Power BI dashboard in real time. Now, when we build something like this, this is somewhat expensive, but when data changes in the source system, you will see it in the Power BI dashboard within seconds. That's as real time as it gets. Does um, it make I, sense? Yeah. Uh, Mariano yeah. has a, a question for you. I understand using Parquet files, but isn't this the kind of problem that NoSQL databases like Cosmos DB and MongoDB are made to resolve? They can resolve it, but and this is why we have data architects, right? To tell you when it's time to use Cosmos versus Parquet files. Um, uh, look, I don't work for Microsoft, so I can say what I want, even if it makes Chuck cringe. I love Cosmos. I think Cosmos <laughs> is an amazing product. 
but it is expensive and files are not. And so you get to, when you have um, a cloud solution, you have a lot of different knobs to turn, like we talked about earlier, where I can make this faster, make that slower, make it faster, right? So Cosmos is a fast knob, but you pay for that. And Parquet is a little bit slower, but it's far, far cheaper. And isn't MongoDB, I mean, don't you have to really go into coding to get your data into MongoDB? And same with Cosmos, a lot so, of coding. So if not, we're really- quite as fast or easy. If we're, to, if we're talking coding. about the citizen developer, so not- um, I think they'll have a much easier time in Parquet than yeah. they will with Cosmos. Right. Yep, yep, I think you're right, Belinda, yep. Okay, so um, let's come, so when I say this is the fast and this is the consistent path, when we combine them together, I'm skipping around here just so you can see, oh, hang on. I don't have a slide, I thought I did. If you Google something called a Lambda architecture. Can, I bing, data, can I bing it? You can bing it, okay. yep. <laughs> you Google or bing Lambda, you will see when we look at the images, you'll see speed layer, batch layer, speed layer, batch layer, speed layer, batch layer, speech layer, serving layer, batch layer, right? This will be true in all modern data architectures. They are separating fast and low data latency, meaning the source changes, the report changes, from batch and serving, meaning um, we want high consistency, high data clean, you know, um, easy to consume, right? So it's important to know that Power BI obeys the same principles. Um, so in Power BI, you could have a real-time dashboard that's that's pulling data here off of the stream, or you could have tiles or reports that are batch, that are pulling it out of SQL or Parquet files that have used a little bit more processing. Um, and we even have ups to turn with Power BI. If we go back here, remember, Power BI can pull data from staging, and that could be pretty fast, maybe not real time, but pretty fast. It can pull data from ODS, it can pull data from Data Mart, or it can pull data from the Event Hub stream with Stream Analytics. That's more real time, right? I want to emphasize that you're making a choice here, and the farther to the right, the cleaner the data, and the farther to the left, the dirtier the data, but the faster it will be, right? But you, what you need to do is make sure that the decision makers understand that decision that they're making. So when we tell a decision maker that we have a consistent report that we're building, we want to never say one version of the truth that all the data will be cleaned, that all the data will be consistent, because that is not true. And those statements are what will make data analytic projects fail when we see sweeping statements like that. You need to say that these reports will be consistent with each other, but we try to keep our consistent reports less than 50 reports. We remind them of the boat ownership principle for data. Meaning when you ask me to build a report, I'm gonna immediately ask you, is this an ad hoc report or a consistent report? If it's a consistent report, it's gonna take me six weeks to build that report. If it's an ad hoc report, I can give it to you today, but don't expect it, all the data to be perfectly aligned They'll be reasonably aligned, what I call that materially aligned. They'll be materially consistent with your other reporting, but they won't be to the penny consistent because I do not have time to do that. So we are communicating with the business so that they understand that they're constantly making this consistency versus performance and speed choices. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, sometimes I like to make a logo that says like the Ford Motor Company consistent reporting logo. And I put that logo on every report so that when they, on every consistent report, so that when we choose those 50 reports that are highly consistent, built up the same data warehouse and the same Power BI data set, I put that logo there so that they know I check and double check and triple check these reports to answer Belinda's question from earlier all the time. I consider checking these reports a core part of my job that I do all the time, but I keep the number of reports that I check low and I do not check the ad hoc reports. Those ad hoc reports are not my responsibility to make consistent. 
they're the responsibility of the decision maker that I handed those reports to. So and this is wrong, this is your Ike certified logo. Yeah, exactly. That's right. That's right. Yep. Yep. Okay, we've already talked about alerting. Um, we've talked about breaking stuff down um, already. Um, up, up, you know, here's some best practices for designing a proper data lake. Um, I'm not going to get into that now, but um, you can read this slide about. I teach a data lake architecture um, class. Uh, actually, I teach a 75-minute how data lakes should be organized uh, lecture, too, if you ever want to hear that one. Um, OK. Uh, we've already talked about data virtualization. I've showed you, like, if you want to create tables off of Parquet, have you ever created a table in SQL? Create temporary table, width, int, length, int, height, int. If you've created a table in SQL, in Spark, it's the same logic. It's just using Parquet. We're using snapping compression, right? Create table, my table. Here's the columns using Hive, right? We've got a bunch of different options for creating those tables, but that syntax isn't that hard. And then if we want to pull it out, look, a group by, you can write queries just like that if you want. Here's some more queries that you can write just like that, no problem. So. Uh, actually, before we go to the conclusion, let me just show you a really simple example of Power BI data modeling. I'm just going to build a star schema right in front of you. Does that sound fun? And then we'll it close does up. sound fun. <laughs> okay, how much time do I have? Um, you have, there's uh, 16 more minutes in the session. So um, you oh, have, uh, you have, you know, you could take it all. And since we've been taking questions all along, or we could leave room for questions at the end. Okay, well, I'll just show you a quick star schema. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go pull some data from SQL Server. And this is a very simple schema, but it's a transactional system. So very simple transactional system. And I'm just going to go in and grab a few tables that I think are interesting. I think those are interesting tables. And I'm going to load them up. Now, when I look at the data model for this, that doesn't look very starry. Oh, I didn't even get everything. Let me uh, go get everything real quick. Do, do, do. I can't believe I do, didn't do, get. Do. Yep, I didn't get order details. So let's go grab order details. One of the attendees, Kelly, um, she's a uh, one of the dynamic communities chapter leader here in Charleston for another group. She actually wrote do do do. Oh, nice. Okay, <laughs> so. So anyway, this doesn't look very starry to me, does it? So yeah. how do we get this to be a star schema? We just go into transform data. And let's say I grab the order details table. And what I like, this is what I've learned to do in, um, oh, you know what? Hang on, I got to be careful. Chuck, I got to be careful. I can't do this while Chuck's around. Hang on one second. We're not, are we recording this? Yes. Uh oh. YouTube is okay. recording it. I think that one might be out of date, by the way. So um, hang on one second. So that one might be out of date. I got to be careful. Dang it. Um, you don't get it from the store? No. And the reason why I don't get it from the store is because um, I'm, I've got an NDA version. Yeah, um, I was going to say, I, I give him special builds he can't show, Belinda. I can't uh. show, right? And I just that's, noticed that's my that... that's my fault. So this 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 pause that you see is because of Chuck. So I apologize to everybody. That's and, uh... okay. Yeah, I just realized. Um, luckily, I don't think I showed anything that was NDA. So that was the new UI, by the way, that was just released, and um, that I'll, UI I'll, is I'll now go official. And, I think I can chop it out too. I'll try to chop it out. Oh, that'd be great. Okay, yep. I appreciate. I mean, my, my, Linda, make myself. Linda, I don't, I, Linda, I don't think, I don't think you need to. There was, there was nothing there. Okay. I, didn't, I, I was watching. Okay. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So, yeah. I usually double and triple check that, and for some reason, I didn't double check today. My I had own. a blog post one time, and I had um, when I switched to using the one from the store, and um, uh, another MVP wrote me. I think you're showing one of the. Um, the preview ones, you're not supposed to show that. And I, I panicked and dropped my blog. And then I realized, oh, wait, 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 I wasn't showing that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, you can, 
you you can show preview. You can you can show preview. Yeah, no, it was it was one the of the it was one of the earlier ones that I was. Um, yeah, and it may uh, not have been anything. I even the one I had that was like that might not have even been anything that was NDA. But um, I don't think I have any that are NDA. But still, um, I still panic for a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and uh, Mariana wrote. Um, me building data warehouse is complicated. Ike, let's build a star schema on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> You're funny, yes. Mariano. Actually, is- Mariano, I'm going to mute myself for a second. I'm going to have you join for the last 15 minutes. I'll send you a um, a Teams um, a Teams invite. So it's all you now, Ike. Okay, great. So I believe, let me just double check, do, 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 do. Um, so I don't like that this is always kind of buried down here, by the way. Um, so this is the March 2020 build. So we are good. Yay. All right. So I'm going to go grab SQL Server. And All right, so this is a transactional system. Can you guys still hear me? I, I think you can. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm going to go grab some tables that I'm interested in, and I'm going to load them up. I love how quick Power BI is to ingest data. Yeah. Love, we can we can so hear you, data. and and Mariana's on his phone, so he can't join in. So that's okay. So if you look at the schema here, it's not quite a star schema. So we need to clean this up just a little bit. So the way I do that is now with the new UI, you guys know that it's transform data now instead of edit queries, right? So we mm-hmm. click on transform data and I go to my order details. And what I like to do in Power Query, what I've learned to do is I like to make like a couple of changes and see it reflect on the data model. So in this case, I'm going to bring in some orders, but really the only thing I need here is I need like the freight charge. I need the, the customer ID. And then I like to get the ship country and maybe the order date. And all these other things I don't necessarily need. So I click OK. I watch those columns get added in. Now, one thing that I like to use is the data profiling features of Power Query. So if I see when I'm looking at columns, I'm trying to evaluate if these columns are worth reporting off of, right? So for instance, if I look at the order ID column, I can see the data distribution, right? There's 378 distinct values. 51 of them are unique, meaning 51 of those orders only have one line item. 378 unique orders, but there's thousands of orders here, right? And I get my min and max and my average, right? If I want to look at, say, hey, that freight charge that I just brought in, what's that look like? Well, the min is, apparently I charged somebody 12 cents of freight to ship something. And, oh, I I gave somebody 1,000. And my average was about $88 of freight. Now, and I can see the distribution of the values coming right down here. That happens because in Power Query, I can look at view and I can see column quality, column distribution, column profile. I can see, look at 100% valid. This is really good that I'm not getting any errors in these columns. And very few of these columns have empty rows. All very, very good. So I've got some high quality data here I'm pretty excited about. And then what I did is I brought some freight charges and from the orders table. And now what I like to do here is I like to close and apply. And now that I've got this, do, 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 do right there. All right. Do, do, do. Now what I can do is I can remove, I can hide this table. And if I hide this table, I can start deleting some of these relationships, right? Now, what you'll find is ship country came in here, but I lost the shipper name. So I want to create a relationship to get rid of this table. So if I come back and I go to transform data and I go back to my order details table, I can, let's kill this expanded column. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to orders. I can clear this. I want, what do I want? I want order date. I want freight. I want ship country, but I also want the shipper ID. So then I click okay. I close and apply. I come back here, and what this allows me to do is delete these relationships just like this.
And now I can take the source, the, the sales orders table completely out of this and I can grab this guy and I can say, take um, cust ID and drop it onto, oh, I forgot to get cust ID, uh-oh. Uh-oh. Roseanne, Roseanne, Dana, it's always something. It's always something, that's right. Let's go back to orders, cust ID, shipper ID, freight, ship country, um, order date. All right, now I can grab cust ID, drop it on cust ID here. Oh, oh, relationship's already created. Let's do shipper ID. Shipper ID, drop it there. Now I have that relationship. Okay, what's left? I've got suppliers going to products and I've got categories. So let's clean up the products table a little bit. So we'll go back to transform data. We'll go to the products table. I'll, under suppliers, I'll bring in the supplier name and maybe the contact name, and maybe I care about the phone number, click OK. And then under um, categories, I care about the category name. And now I click OK. There we go. Close and apply. And now what this allows me to do, now that I've got this kind of blown up, is I can get rid of this. I can get rid of this. I can hide this and hide this. And now, does that look like a star schema to you? Yep. And now if I, if I go back and I'm a report author looking at my shared data set, okay, there's a couple of things that I would change here. Like I don't like some of these names. So I'll go back, transform the data, and instead of order details, um, why don't we rename this to just be fact orders or something like that, or how about um, total orders, okay? And instead of um, production.products, maybe I'll rename this to be products. I have what I call Belinda's three rules, and rule number one is changing the name of the data sources to something that makes sense to the end users. Yeah, yeah, and so if you look at this like total orders, we don't need it to be sales.orders.custid. We just need it to be cust ID. Mm -hmm. And we don't need it to be sales orders order date. We can just say order date. And shipper ID. Freight. Now, Mariana wrote, nah, this is super cool. Never thought that you could do that with Power BI. That's because you don't listen to me, Mr. Gomez. <laughs> Come on. Now, we're, we've been good friends for a long time. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's super cool. Yeah, I'm grateful. I, he's a new friend of mine, but I'm grateful for him. Um, so now, if you were a brand new report writer, does this data model look daunting to you? Do you feel like this is becoming more usable, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it even makes the DAX easier to write, right? So for instance, if I come in here and I say, let's create a new measure, and I say, well, actually, before I create a new measure, let's create a new column. New column. And we'll say total line sales equals um, quantity times unit price. And now let's create a measure. And we'll just say total sales equals sum uh, total line sales. And now the minute we get, we have a, a DAX calculation, a measure, that gives us what we want. So let's just verify. Do we have what we want? Yes, we did about 1.6 million in sales. Now, um, if I wanted to see the, you know, the card, or 1.354 million, yep, that's about right. Then what I can do is the calculated column I might have built off of that um, I can I can just hide it if I did, if I don't want to see it anymore. Now I've see how I'm simplifying the data model. I might be building something for my purposes, but the report author doesn't need to see it. So we fight to distill, um, and we will find that our users will always be using the things that we've been building. 
So yes, we still make star schemas. Uh, we haven't talked about slowly changing dimensions. That's okay. Yes, we still use cubes or share data sets that are effectively the same thing, but we need to understand their limitations. Don't be afraid of files. Don't be afraid of real-time analytics. Don't conflate a learning and speed. Build a consistent reporting culture where you consistent reports around 50 or less, and then everything else is ad hoc. Um, and then yes, we can build analytic systems without being overly reliant on SQL, and we can be very successful doing it. That's it, guys. Thanks for your time. That is amazing. I, that was really good. A lot of good information. Um, I'm going to have to go back and watch this over again so I can like pick up on what maybe I missed. So um, very cool. All right. Is that your dog, Ike? Nope. That's not me. That's Chuck's dog. <laughs> okay. <Yep. laughs> All right. Let me pull up. Um, actually, if you would just stop sharing your screen. The sure. only other slides I had were, um, let me just go through those last two slides real fast. And then we'll open up the floor to questions. So I have a Q&A. And of course, for those of you who are not from Charleston, this is part of our beautiful city that everyone should come and visit. And um, I also wanted to show the screen so I could remember to not only thank Ike and Chuck, but also thank Retta and Rhett, my co-chapter uh, leaders. So we're back to you guys. So um, great presentation. Love the voice impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I imitate him a lot. I shouldn't do that. I imitate Mariano on a regular basis. Um, so, um, yeah, a lot of really good information. Uh, people are really happy with what they're seeing. Uh, Rhett had to leave a while ago, and he actually included that this was a great presentation, and he was hoping, is by any chance that slide deck available for you to PDF? Yes, and it's, on my, it's on my blog already. Okay. Okay, good. So go to this blog and you guys will have access to that. That was on the slide at the very beginning, which is just ikeellis.com, right? It is yep. ikeellis.com. Yep. So not even that many letters. So that was pretty, that was pretty amazing. So um, you got me excited about Azure Data Lakes again. I started in on them and investigating them. I want to say it was two years ago and then I backed off. And now there's been a little bit more interest in me. So how long have you been working with Azure Data Lake? Um, since the beginning. Yeah. At, 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 um, my company, Science, uh, we wrote all of the um, documentation for, not all of it, but a large part of the documentation for HD Insight. And we've written a lot of the learning paths that you find on the Microsoft Learn site. If you're familiar with the learning paths, they're great. Our company is writing them for Databricks, Power BI. Um, I think I don't know. Uh, we so Microsoft often asks outside expertise for help in developing content and courseware, mm -hmm. and then and thankfully Microsoft actually gives us credit for that. So, uh, which is very nice of them. They don't have to do that because they paid for it. They don't have to credit us, but they do. Um, so we've built documentation for around Azure Data Lake storage, and we've done almost every project that we do uses. ADLS and SQL Server. I, I want to be clear. I realized that I was being critical of SQL, but um, that is not because I don't love it. I love it. I think SQL is an amazing, wonderful product. What I don't like is when people learn SQL and then kind of when you're a hammer, everything's a nail. They just use it for everything. And I want to remove the knee jerk reaction to just always use it because you know it, you know? It's totally okay to use other things. Right, right. And um, so also I, I have a question about, and, and you, you your whole session was about this, but if you could just uh, make a little more statement about um, building reports off of production data versus warehouse. Yeah, so if you build it off production data, what you're doing is you're putting a ton of data cleaning logic in the report. And so if you have to build five or six or 10 reports like that, often you don't get reuse. They'll, they'll often build other data sets for different people. So you're not actually getting any lift from that. And as much as I love Power BI, um, Power BI is wonderful for empowering users to clean and organize data, but it isn't a properly engineered data pipeline. Meaning 
when you build it in Power Query, you are using this very low code environment to clean it, um, which doesn't give you some pretty important things that you would want in a in a regular data pipeline, like multicasting it to different places. Meaning, what happens if I if I grab data from a source system, and when I grabbed it in one pull, part of the data went to the batch processing layer, and another part went to the speed layer, right? You can't really do that in Power Query, but you get to do that in Azure Data Factory and in Databricks. So um, there, there, that, there's things like that. What happens if I'm making security decisions in flight? Meaning some of this data, no one can see. And some of this data, five people can see and some 20 people can see. Power Query and Power BI are good at doing that as the end reporting process, but they're not really good at that at saying, when the data is coming in, we're making security decisions as the data is flowing. It's not super great at that. So, so when Power and, and Query is I, one- and I, I, Can I interrupt just for a second? Yeah. So it, back to the Power Query doesn't let you do multicasting and stuff like that. Uh, Sandy Winarco, a good friend of mine, actually he owns ADF, and he realizes that bringing those together is really important. So you can actually go out and use your Power Query M code as steps or modular chunks in your ADF pipeline. So I, you should have I yeah. come back and actually, he, he covers that really well, but it is a better together story. Yeah, It yeah. is a better together, yes, yeah. yes. So this isn't me saying don't, you know, always do one thing or another. This is me saying like, these products have ways that they work together and we need to make a, a decision on how we're going to, we need to make an active decision on how we're going to make them work together. Cool. Cool. Wow. That was amazing. Actually, a couple other people commented, Mariana, great session. Ike, Jen, uh, Kuntz, great presentation. Uh, Galena uh, wrote, thank you so much for valuable information. You both have been tremendous and you both put yourself on the hook for presenting again because I heard you both and I have it on tape. So, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Chuck and I love presenting together, so we're happy to do another uh, tag team. Very oh, much yeah. so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy, that would happy be great. To help. That would be great. Okay, so everybody, I'm going to wrap it up right there. I hope everybody uh, stays safe. And oh, Mari Mariano added, find the right tool for each part of the job. Yep, that's true. That's true, Mariano. So um, next time, Mariano will have to not be on his phone. Oh, here's another one. Thank you for the presentation from John. So yep, thank you both. And everybody who Thanks participated, you thank you for watching. And many of you will probably be like me and want to watch it again. And I'm sure people who will be watching it after the fact will be disappointed that they weren't watching it live to ask you questions immediately. So they'll be <laughs> looking for that again. So everybody, please stay safe and have a good one. And we'll see you they next can month. Tweet me. They can tweet questions to me, by the way. And they can, oh. I'm a friendly guy, so I'll answer. Ooh, Ike said yep. you could tweet him questions. Yep. Be careful what you ask for, Ike. Okay. <laughs> All, right. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. Be safe. Thank you for